Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 again. This is the last time we'll be in chapter 5, and in fact, this is the last time we'll be in chapter 6. We'll be reading through the rest of chapter 5, all of chapter 6, and breaking into chapter 7 uh, next week or the week after. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting in verse 10, picking up where Pastor Cameron left off last week. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Blessing and Curse of Riches and Labor in Life Under the Sun. This morning we'll be covering quite a long passage of Scripture in Ecclesiastes. As I said before, we'll be covering the rest of chapter 5 through the end of chapter 6. And this portion of Scripture that we're looking at, it marks the end of the first part of the preacher's writing as he searches for lasting profit. Uh, The end of chapter 5 into chapter 6 marks the end of this first portion. And it marks a transition into the next part as he searches for true and abiding knowledge in the world. For so long, he's asked the question, what profit? What profit is there to a man that does such and such? What profit is there in wisdom, in learning? What profit is there in labor and in work? And at the end of this passage, he'll ask the question, who knows? Who knows what is good? Who knows what comes after this life? And all of these questions we know find their answer in the living God. But first, we'll begin by examining this last object that so many fools try to find meaning in. It is this object to seek to answer the question, what profit has wealth for a man? And as we uncover the blessing and the curse of riches and labor and life under the sun, we'll seek to answer if there is any profit truly in wealth. And we'll see what traps are laid at our feet by our great enemy. And perhaps we'll reflect on men who have fallen into these traps. And by God's grace, we'll be made aware and kept from stumbling in such a way. So I'll ask that you stand and read. Stand with me if you're able as I read uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, through the end of chapter 6. And this is the word of the Lord. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its produce. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the success to their masters except to look on with their eyes? The sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the satisfaction of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is a sickening evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their master to his own evil demise. And those riches were lost through a bad endeavor. And he became the father of a son, but there was nothing in his hand for him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will carry nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can bring in his hand. So this also is a sickening evil. Exactly as a man came, so will he go. So what is the advantage to him who labors for the wind? Also, all his days he eats in darkness with much vexation and his sickness and anger. Here is what I have seen to be good, which is beautiful, to eat, to drink, and to see good in all one's labor in which he labors under the sun during the few days of his life which God has given him, for this is his portion. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to take up his portion and be glad in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not remember much the days of his life because God allows him to occupy himself with the gladness of his heart. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. A man to whom God gives riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not empower him to eat from them, for a foreigner eats from them. This is vanity and a sickening evil. 
If a man becomes the father of 100 children and lives many years, how many the days of his years may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. For that one comes in vanity and goes into darkness, and that one's name is covered in darkness. Indeed, that one never sees the sun and never knows anything. That one has more rest than he. Even if the other man lives 1,000 years twice and does not see good things, do not all go to the same place? All a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not fulfilled. For what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the afflicted man have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul goes after. And this too is vanity and striving after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named and is known what man is. And he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he is. For there are many words which increase vanity. What then is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few days of his vain life? He will make do with them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? You may be seated. Please bow your heads and bow your hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for gathering us together again. Thank You for gathering us together to worship You. May this sermon, may this preaching be worship to You. Father, would You speak through me by Your Holy Spirit to Your people. That we would not live a vain life. That we would not be governed by lust and greed. Please open each and every one of our eyes and hearts this morning to examine ourselves to see whether we're satisfied in You or whether we grumble against You, whether we're consumed with desire for other things. Father God, would You help me today? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verses 10-12 through 12 in chapter 5 we'll begin with these three verses, which are three Proverbs to begin the beginning of this last discourse on wealth. Three separate Proverbs, they build on one another, but the Word says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its produce. This too is vanity. And when good things increase... Those who consume them increase. So what is the success of their masters except to look on with their eyes? And the sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the satisfaction of the rich man will not allow him to sleep. The first of these beginning Proverbs is the first of the curses we'll see of the vanity of riches. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its produce. This vanity is the first curse of regarding riches, and it's really a curse of greed. It's a curse of lust. A desire to have something which is not yours, which does not belong to you. An overruling and overcoming desire that, that propels you through life. The rich man in this case loves money. And the rich man in this case who loves money will never be satisfied with riches. The foundation of his life is the pursuit of money. He doesn't pursue money or wealth for some righteous end, but simply for the acquisition of it. Simply for the gaining. That is his end. And of course, he will never be satisfied. He'll never have enough. And we see that his life is built on sand. And the next proverb, when good things increase, or when goods increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the success to their masters except to look on with their eyes? When goods, when prosperity increases, when abundance flows, so do those who can consume them 
This is the second curse of riches that we see here in this passage. And it's a promise. It's a guarantee, really. Showing the vain nature of pursuing wealth that you'll never have enough. You'll never have enough wealth. You'll never have all of the wealth. And what you do have, you will always give away. And consider the modern businessman when we think of this proverb. When goods increase, so do those who consume them. The modern businessman, he hires a numerous staff. He hires many workers for him. Salesmen, manufacturers, accountants. He does so to scale his business, to grow, to accumulate more wealth, to accumulate more profit. It's an investment, but to each of these workers, they're a consumer in their own in their own right. They consume his wealth. He has to pay them to get them to work for him, to accumulate more money. So he brings in money and he gives away as much as he brings in. It's a vain cycle and nothing comes into his hand that is not soon to depart. And it's all done in the name of getting more. Now, this of course is not a sinful practice. This is the practice of business and commerce. It's just showing the vanity If you desire to have all of the wealth to be the most profitable, to outdo everyone, all of the money that comes into your hand is soon to go out. It's the simple law of business. Consider also the slave owner of old. He didn't have to pay his workers, but even the slave owner, even though one who treats his slaves as family, not property, this man has many fields, and so he has many slaves to work the fields. And as many fields as he has, if he's blessed with abundance in those days, He might be a great wealthy man, and yet all of his produce is not his. He must feed his family. He must feed all of those who work for him so that he can continue to work, to continue to produce more. And so what he brings into his bins, his grain bins, he gives back out to keep the produce flowing. And consider someone like Solomon, the king. A king who cultivates a field. Like in verse 9 of chapter 5, the advantage of the land and everything is a king committed to cultivating a field. Of course, we see that in Solomon. He's committed to riches, to prosperity in the kingdom, to establishing peace in his kingdom. And he does so. And for such a king, it will not be long before foreigners flow up to his city to sit in the shade of peace and riches and the prosperity that such a king has worked to establish. And all that work that he did to acquire peace, he must work all the more in order to maintain that peace and the riches for all these new consumers who come into his city. And prosperity is a great and glorious thing given by God. But it is vanity if your end is to only accumulate more and more. Because it will only be consumed. It will only be swept away. It will only be taken away in order to get more. The preacher goes on, he says in the third proverb, the sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the satisfaction of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. This is the third curse of riches and labor. Sleeplessness. Even the laborer, he has his own vanity, that that vanity that Solomon elaborated on in chapter 3 of the constant cycle of work year after year and generation after generation and it's the same work and the work is never completed or finished. But even this laborer is able to rest and sleep. He's able to go home and lay down and rest his, his bones and his muscles and his mind for a night before he gets up and labors again. But he who loves riches has no rest. His satisfaction will not allow him to sleep, verse, 13, or verse 12 says. And that's to say essentially that his lack of satisfaction will not allow him to sleep. In verse 10, remember, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Satisfied. His satisfaction won't allow him to sleep. He's never satisfied. He's always working to accumulate more wealth. He needs to fill his bank account. He needs to have enough savings. He needs to you know, diversify his portfolio. And this is along the lines of that first curse of greed, but there's nothing to satisfy this one. He always wants more, and so he's haunted. He's pursued. He's driven, as with a whip, by this greed and lust for more and more, which he will never have. And so he never has rest. He never can lay his head down. He's always on the grind. And in fact, he idolizes his work ethic. 
but he knows no satisfaction in this life and it's all vanity and a curse. Now we continue on to verse 13. The preacher continues his observation, but here we'll see he amplifies this observation. Now it is not mere vanity, but these are great curses that he sees in verses 13 through 15. He says, There is a sickening evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their master to his own evil demise. And those riches were lost through a bad endeavor, and he became the father of a son, but there was nothing in his hand for him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He'll carry nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can bring in his hand. You see, this is not only vanity itself, vanity like the other vanities we have seen, vanity like the Proverbs, this meaninglessness. You're working for nothing. You're working for sand which falls out of your hand. But this is in fact evil that we see here. This pursuit of riches as an end to itself is a great and sickening evil in the mind of the preacher. This fickle, fleeting nature of riches is evil and vain in itself. A man can spend his whole life pursuing wealth. His whole identity can be wrapped up in gaining wealth and riches. He can expend himself and even his family to his own detriment, to his own evil end in the name of pursuing wealth. And before he dies, let's say he gathers millions upon millions, let's say he gathers billions of dollars, before he dies, one bad investment, one tragic catastrophe can rip this all from him. His work, his whole life's work amounts to ashes. And what's worse, and this is what makes it so evil, he's not the only one to suffer. It would be bad enough for a man to to spend his whole life working for something only to have it taken away from him at the end and he dies for nothing. But he's not the only one to suffer. It says he became a father, the father of a son, and there was nothing in his hand to give him. What makes this curse so sickening is that the man is utterly ashamed. He's shamed, and not only himself, but his family is shamed. See, his whole life is centered around wealth. He thought to work all his life to make his children rich. He bore a son and desired to bestow a gift, a vast inheritance. Instead, all he can give him is a hollow childhood and a pile of debts. His sons are left destitute as he is, in a worse state than he was. They never even had a father. This curse is so sickening because the foolish, vain man not only wants to waste his life, but he wastes and shame the life of his family. He assumes his, or expends his family like an investment instead of that which they should be investing in. A father ought to ease the burden of his children and aid them with the blessings of God, but this one inadvertently casts a yoke and estranges his son. We see that here, and we'll touch on it in a moment, that that purpose of wealth, it's implied here in verse 15. Excuse me. In verse 14, he loses all of his wealth, and the vanity is that he became the father of a son. The wealth was to be given to the next generation. That is why we work. That is the the purpose of working and accumulating wealth and riches. It's not to have the nice things for your generation. But it's to work. And we'll see in a moment how to work and to secure, to bless your children. But this vain man only becomes a curse to his sons. He goes on in verse 16. 16 and 17. This also is a sickening evil. Exactly as a man came, so will he go. So what is the advantage to him who labors for the wind? Also, all his days, he eats in darkness with much vexation and his sickness and anger. This is the case of the same man, the same man we just read about earlier. This sickening evil that all he has is left behind. He can take nothing with him in his hands. And it asks, what advantage is there to the one who labors for the wind? There is no advantage. What are you laboring for then? 
The vanity and the curse of riches, it's not only their fickle and fleeting nature, it's their limited and temporal nature only to this life. Even if that man kept his wealth, he would still leave it behind. You see, Matthew 16, 26, the Lord asks, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? But such a man as this, a man who loves riches, he does just that. He forfeits his soul. He exchanges his soul. He seeks to exchange his soul for the world. He seeks a prize which he'll never have. And he pays a price which can never be refunded. And if that weren't terrible enough, the man often sells not only the birthright of his soul, but just as the reprobate Esau, he loses the blessing of his heritage. He squanders his family and alienates any who love him in the name of pursuing riches, perhaps even in the name of securing the ones whom he ought to love. He eats in darkness with much vexation, it says. He eats in sickness and anger. He eats and lives and dies cold, empty, and alone. Because exchange, he exchanged his life, his family, his heritage, his blessing for another dollar. Even those whom he'd seek to bless, he's alienated by because he abandoned his station. This is a sickening evil indeed. But now the preacher turns to blessing. Now, in verse 18, the preacher looks at the landscape of life, he looks at the landscape of those who would accumulate wealth, even himself who would live for wealth. He sees the, the vanity and the snares and traps. Now he sees the blessing. What has he learned in all this? This central point of the passage. He says, Here is what I have seen to be good, which is beautiful, to eat, to drink, and to see good in all one's labor in which he labors under the sun during the few days of his life which God has given him. Why? Because this is his portion. He goes on, Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, He has also empowered him to eat from them and to take up his portion and be glad in his labor. This is the gift of God. This is the central portion of this passage. This kind of denotes a chiastic structure to what we're about to, what we have been reading all the way through chapter 6. You have this kind of ascent, this building of curses. And it's a curse, curse, curse. And then we have a blessing centralized. And then another curse and a curse and a curse afterwards. And after this blessing that we'll read, we'll see more vanity and curses follow. And the vanity and the curses, they parallel what we just read. And I point this out to just show that the, the method of, of Solomon's mind here is to show the central importance. What is the value of wealth in this life? What is it to be used for? This is what's more, most important. Yes, be aware of the curses. Be aware of the snares and the traps. Don't be like the fool who says, I'll only ever live as a beggar because this wealth thing, it's just vanity anyways. No, this is the central point. What is the purpose of riches? What is the purpose of blessing? Of working and laboring to acquire wealth? What is good and beautiful and true regarding riches and labor in this life? How can a man work and invest in a way that is not sheer vanity? It is this. It is, as we've seen earlier, to eat and to drink, to see all good in one's labor in which he labors under the sun. It is to be satisfied in what God has given you, in the portion He has given you, in the time He has placed you. It is the same thing we have seen for the last five chapters. And it is also this. Well, that's the, the first point, but it's also this. Furthermore, it's every man who, whom God has given riches and wealth, He has empowered him to eat from them and to take up his portion and to be glad in his labor. So first, how does one combat the vanity and the curse of greed? It is by contentment in the portion which the Lord God has seen fit to assign him. It's contentment in the labor which God has given you to, to do. 
It is not this idea of climbing the ladder to get a new and better job, to get a new and better life, to get a bigger and better paycheck. This discontentment, this idea that you're going to be the president of the company which you started at the bottom of, and that's the meaning of your life. Rather, it's working in this portion that we see God has given you. Working in this labor happily and joyfully. That's the first of this two-pronged blessing. The second blessing with contentment is that of a thankful and gracious heart. A heart which recognizes Yahweh who is the giver of every good gift. You see, the, the blessing that God gives this man in verse 19 He's empowered him to eat from his riches. He has blessed him to be able to enjoy the riches and abundance we ha- which he has been given. And not to enjoy to his own vain ends, but to be glad in his labor and to take up his portion. That word of the portion, it goes back again to verse 18. The labor which God has given you, this is your portion. And then to the one who has riches, he is able to enjoy them. He's empowered to eat them. He's em- empowered to use them in order to work the work which God has given him. That is the gift of God. And note, the preacher doesn't allow for us to conclude that wealth itself is a trap. Wealth is not a vanity or a curse. In fact, wealth to the godly, it is a gracious gift from God. He's empowered him to eat from his riches. The Lord has richly sustained this man to continue in the labor that he's given him. This man lives truly as the good steward of the parable. And it says, he will not remember much the days of his life because God allows him to occupy himself with the gladness of his heart. Somewhat of a difficult verse, a little bit confusing perhaps. The King James Version is a little bit helpful. It helps us to see. It says, he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Or one translation, one interpreter would say, for one will not greatly ponder the days of his life Because God keeps him occupied with the enjoyment of his heart. Now this isn't some vain entertainment that Solomon has already put to bed. But rather it's saying that this man has all that he needs. The Lord sustains him in the riches that he has so that he can work in the work that God has given him to do. And he's not sitting at home folding his hands thinking about all of the terrible things he's done in his past life. He's not sitting at home thinking about all the things he's done in the past that were mistakes that would have put him off in a better position. No. He's busy at work. The Lord has kept him busy with the task at hand and the man is satisfied in his soul. He's not burdened by the past. He's not burdened by the future. He is happy to serve the Lord. This is the one who is satisfied in the living God. The God who has blessed them, given everything He needs to sustain Him. These men are blessed to live daily in the presence and favor of God. And they recognize Him and they are satisfied in Him alone. This is that great blessing which we should strive to have for ourselves. Though you be not rich, Do you have enough to sustain you today? Do you have enough to feed your family? That you can work and train them to work in the work which God has given you to do? Then glorify God in this. He goes back to a curse though. In chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, he says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. A man to whom God gives riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not empower him to eat from them. For a foreigner eats from them. This is vanity and a sickening evil. The curse, this curse pursuing riches, the curse of pursuing riches as your end, it is alike to the blessing of riches. The blessing before is that God has given you what you need. The blessing before is that God has given you the ability to eat and to consume what you need so that you can work. But this curse, it is the opposite. A man's wealth is a curse when he expends himself to acquire it and may never even use it, may never even see it, may never take joy from the blessing. Alike to the vanity in verse 11, this man, he's not able to use or enjoy any benefit of his wealth. Because then, 
it was given in part to the consumers, to, to those who worked for Him, or to those who would get wealth for Him. And here, it's given, it's, it's taken by the foreigner. It's taken and given to the man who has not labored, but this man who has not labored will eat from the fruit of another man's labor. And this is, as Solomon says, a great evil. It is a great vanity. It is the curse of pursuing riches as your only end. This exact thing is often used as a curse, a judgment of God's wrath against the wicked. And consider the Canaanites who were spewed out of the land under God's wrath. And He gave that land to His beloved Israel. That was a blessing to Israel. You'll eat the fruit of the fields which you did not labor in. But it was a curse and a judgment to Canaan. And so it is a curse and a judgment to this man who labors all his life. He accumulates wealth and it's taken from him and given to the foreigner. Why? Because he's not satisfied in the living God? Because he does not know Him? To show him that this end for gaining wealth is vain in itself. Then it gets worse, it goes on. Like the man who lost his riches and had no inheritance to his son, so is this man in verses 3 through 7. And in this case, this passage, it's kind of a transition point. Now he's not talking about just wealth, but he's looking more broadly at life as he's concluding his first part of looking at the, the advantage, the wealth, the, the prosperity of man, if there's any meaning in these. He, he looks to life in general and he says, if a man becomes the father of 100 children, and lives many years, however many the days of his years may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. For that one comes in vanity and goes into darkness, and that one's name is covered in darkness. Indeed, that one never sees the sun and never knows anything. That one has more rest than he. Even if the other man lives 1,000 years twice and doesn't see good, don't all go to the same place. All a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not fulfilled. Here, for example, the preacher posits a man who has been blessed with much wealth. Now, it doesn't speak generally of wealth or specifically, but we assume he has been blessed with much wealth. He has been blessed with much in general. The man's been richly in favor, excuse me, richly favored outwardly by God. He's been given many children, even a hundred children. He's been richly favored by God outwardly. He's been given much life, a long life, even 2,000 years. Yet for this man, this man so seemingly blessed, the preacher reveals it's a curse to him. It's a judgment against him if his soul is not satisfied with good things. The Scriptures speak of Blessing of a man with regards to long life, many children, even riches. This man has all these things. But he does not enjoy them. He's not satisfied. For that man who has so much abundance given by God, but is not satisfied in his soul by the rich and generous God, the preacher says it is better that he were never born. We have to consider the juxtaposition in this passage. It's a hard comparison hard for us to wrap our minds around, stark in contrast. And yet, the preacher says that the miscarried child is better off than such a man that is so richly blessed in this life and does not know the living God or is satisfied with Him. Well, how can this be? This is not to say that it is better to die than to live, like many of our pagan cultists today would say. But rather, what he's doing is he's highlighting and exposing what a cursed life that vain man first lived. The man who had all that blessing and yet never saw fit to acknowledge God. And I know, you see, many families in our church know the sting of the pain of miscarriage. And miscarriage oftentimes in the Scriptures is Especially in this time of writing, it carries the weight of God's curse. And so you have that juxtaposition of this appearing blessing and this appearing curse. And many of our families, many of our mothers here know that at the lowest point of your loss and at the height of your pain, it feels as though you're cursed or forgotten by God. and feels as though you're alone 
and there is nothing for you. But you, dear friends, who have known such a pain as this, you've felt in the deepest way the sting of the result of sin's corruption and this curse. And you do know truly what a hateful enemy death is and how our enemy is emboldened by our rebellion and sin. What a lamentable evil it is for a child to die before his time. And yet, consider this, dear friends. The Bible here, the very Word of God, tells us it is better off for that poor child who never was able to receive the gift of a single breath of life outside of his mother's womb. It's better for him who never was able to feel the sun on his skin than for this man who lived 2,000 years, who had a hundred sons and never knew God or was satisfied in Him. Do you understand that? Do you understand what an evil, vain life so many people live these days who think that they are blessed because they have what they need? Do you understand, O sinner under my voice, today what a vain, evil life you live if you are not satisfied in God alone? Do you have the blessing of many children? Do you have many many years that you've lived in this life, even today? What do you have in your hand? Do you have all that you need to eat? Are you satisfied? Do you see the grace of God which is lavished on you? Are you content in the God who has given you these gifts? Or are you merely okay with accepting the gifts themselves and walking through this life and dying empty? Do you think that you're blessed because you have so many good things and others perhaps even envy you? But what do you have when all of that is ripped away from you? What will you have when all of these things which you glory in are taken from you if you are not resting in the living God today? If you are not satisfied in Him? If you do not know Him? If you do not trust in Him to provide for you all these things? What is the purpose? It's vanity. It's emptiness. And it is a great evil. For what advantage does a wise man have over fools? What advantage does the afflicted have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul goes after. And this too is vanity and striving after wind. From the perspective of this life alone, there is no great advantage for the wise over the fool. We all die and go to the grave. Why does it matter if you know a little bit more than another? From the perspective of this life alone, there is no value or advantage of the rich over the poor. Or even to the one who knows how to live well in this life over any other man. The conclusion of the preacher here is the same. All are afflicted. All will die. And there is no advantage under the sun. There is no way to get ahead of another man. We are all on equal footing. In this life under the sun... We are all on equal footing before the living God. It doesn't matter how many riches you have. It doesn't matter how wise you are. You will stand before Him in judgment. And now He goes on. There's no advantage, so who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few days of his life. He'll make do with them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? The man spends his days, and his days pass by like a shadow. There's no substance to them at the end of the day. So, who does know what is good for a man? What should you pursue? What should we find meaning in this life in? What is good for us to do? Who knows? Who can tell a man what will be after the days of his life? Who can tell you what will come after you die, what your sons and your daughters will do, and where you will go when you die? The context of the preacher's rhetoric and his conclusion already in past chapters might lead us to think that the answer is no one. And it's true, no one under the sun knows what is good. No one knows what comes after a man in his life. No one at all knows these things but God alone. And in this, dear friends, The preacher treads familiar ground. Surely no one under the sun knows. But why don't we look a little higher? 
How can we find what will be? How can we know what is good for us? We must look again to the living God and consider His ways. As we prepare to close this morning looking at this whole long passage, let's look back at this text and draw a few points of application here. A few things to draw into our own life. From verses 13 and 15, remember the man who spent his life hoarding hoarding wealth to his own evil demise, to his own evil ends, his, his family abandoned him. Dear friends, why do you work and labor? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you seek a paycheck? Is it for your sons and daughters? Is it for your wife and for your posterity? Are you trying to give your family a gift? How do you work? Are you present with them? Do they know you? Are you trying to give your family a gift, but sacrificing your family in the name of the gift? You might say, I want my children to live like I never did. I want them to be secure and not have to worry about this life. You might say, look at the precarious economy. Everything is going to crash. I need to have a store to secure my family. But brothers and sisters, wealth as we see in this passage, it is a tool and a gift from God to sustain and keep His people. But it is not the end. It is not the goal or the purpose of your life. So work and and pursue security for your family knowing that it's God who gives you security. Knowing that it's God who gives and takes away. And do not sacrifice your family in the name of security. Do you see how this gift so easily becomes a snare and a curse? To men especially, but women as well. People who would exchange the lives, their own lives and the lives of their children. But what good is wealth and riches given to your children if your children hate you? Wouldn't they rather have a father and a mother than all the wealth in the world? So instead of pursuing more and much more, which is just empty vanity in this world, won't you be wise and press in and press deep into what God has given you? Press in for His sake to see how He has richly blessed you. Do you think that you don't have enough? Well, then pray to the God who sustains us for more. But pray also for Him to to search your heart To see if you do have enough. But you're just wanting what you do not need. You're just lusting after something that's not yours. You're coveting what someone else has. Pray for Him to search your heart to see if you are not satisfied in Him. And in what He's given you. Dear friends, don't be like the lamentable, wicked man in the beginning of chapter 6. Don't be like the one who would have been better off dying in infancy. Won't you instead be like the blessed man? Won't you pray for a heart that is satisfied with what God is pleased to give you? Won't you be such a son or daughter who, yes, asks their father for good gifts, but is nevertheless happy and content to know just that their father hears their voice and loves them? Oh, saints, might we all have this heart of holy contentment and peace in whatever state we are in, just like the apostle had of Philippians 4. Verse 11 through 14, not that I speak from want, for I learn to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along and with humble means, and I also know how to live in abundance. In any and all things, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, hungry. Both have having abundance and suffering need. This is the secret. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, to the church who supplied his need, you have done well to fellowship with me in my affliction. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, would we have meaning and purpose in our short lives? Would each of us seek an advantage in this life? As we close this first part of Ecclesiastes and turn to another perspective, you must know the advantage of your life The purpose of your life is to know God. To know Him in the way that He can be known. Through His Son, as He's revealed in His Word. Would you press into Him to know Him, to fear Him, and to praise Him? 
And this is the God who you would know from Lamentations 3, 22-26. The loving kindness of Yahweh indeed never ceases. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Yahweh is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I wait for Him. Yahweh is good to those who hope in Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that He waits silently for the salvation of Yahweh. Might it please the Lord to create in us a heart that is patient, to wait on Him in our need. In our physical need, yes, but especially in our spiritual need. Do you see that you're not satisfied in the Lord today? Do you see that your heart is not full just by hearing His Word proclaimed that there's something still more? Would you wait for the Lord? And press into Him knowing that His loving kindness never ceases and His compassion never fails. Let us pray to God to give us such a heart today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have seen discontentment. We've known men and women who are not content with what you have given them. And we've seen how their lives are destroyed because of it. We see how they are cast into meaninglessness. God, would it be better for us? Father, if we would be satisfied only in temporary things, only in comfort, which you have blessed us with, if we would be satisfied only in security and our physical well-being, which you have blessed us with, Lord, this is not good if we would not be satisfied in knowing you and walking with you as well. Father, would you provoke our spirits and our hearts to seek your face, to earnestly seek your face as we see that wealth and work, wisdom and learning, even vain religiosity, none of these are meaningful in this life. It's all empty. It's all vain. It all goes away. And sometimes it's even a judgment, a curse against us if we do not know You. If we do not rest in You. If we do not press in to know You more. If we cannot hear Your voice and Your Word. If we will not wait on You. Father God, as we pray for your blessing upon us as we go, as we ask for your blessing upon this church as we assemble again and go our separate ways, as we grow over the years, as we contend for your kingdom, Father, all of this is vanity if we do not know you, if we do not fear you and love you and live according to your word. It doesn't matter what disciplines we place in our life. It doesn't matter if we're disciplined with wealth, if we're disciplined with our time, if we're disciplined with our work, if we stand on the corner and preach your gospel and hand out all the tracts of the gospel, if we never know you truly, to walk with you, this is all vanity. Father, would you please bless our people today to burden our hearts to seek your face and to not stop seeking until we have an audience with you, knowing that you are faithful. Your compassions never cease. Your mercies are new every morning. Your loving kindness never runs out. My faith, would you strengthen our faith to wait for you and to rejoice in you when you come. I ask that you would be glorified today 
and the preaching of your word, that your people would be edified, 